Hello, once again, it's Brother Brandon O'Doy of the Hope Church of Christ. This is our weekly community care conference. And this is, of course, our way of being able to pass along real, relatable, and reliable information, considering the fact that we're in a global pandemic that is affecting us all in different and varying ways. And in our community, particularly in the body of Christ, we thought it necessary to bring in those who have specific expertise about various things that are affecting us during COVID-19. With us again is our coordinator, the person who's pulling this entire effort together, Masters in Social Work, Sister Roxana Dunn. Good to have you again, Roxana. We've got part two of how virtually and distance learning is affecting us. Why don't you go ahead and tell us what we'll be discussing on tonight. Okay, so just to recap from last week, we did a disparity on education. And we talked about um, one of the things that we discussed was talking about in Miami-Dade County how only 70, less than 75% of the students were logging on. So, and we were talking about a diff different disparity as to why, what will prevent um, the children or the students from logging on. We talked about things as such as socioeconomic issues. We talked about homelessness. We talked about the inability for the parent to communicate or even understand um, just the verbiage and how to log on to the system. So today I wanted to have two, I wanted to have parents on and also um, teachers. So we got a two for one with Ruben and Vidra Johnson because they're both, they both are parents and teachers and it could give us a better perspective or understanding from both sides of it. And today uh, we'll be discussing uh, some disparities that we talked about last week and I gave them a set of questions to answer. And I guess we could go forward with our questioning. Um, I think the first question was, um, and in, you know what, let me introduce Ruben and Vidra Johnson. Uh, let me allow them to introduce themselves and to tell them, for them to tell you what grades they teach and so on and so forth. So go ahead, Ruben and Vidra. Well, um, I'm Brother Ruben. Um, I've been teaching now for almost one on 12 years in the education system in Broward County. I've taught high school, elementary, and now middle school. So in middle school now I have eighth grade reading. And so that is the background of me as an, an education. Um, good evening, everyone. I am Deidre Johnson. Um, currently I teach science for fifth graders in the Broward County School Board. Um, I've been teaching that for about 10 years. Uh, previously, for one year, I had second grade. And we're both parents in the education system as well. We have a 10-year-old who's in fourth grade and our five-year-old who's in kindergarten. Okay, awesome. Thank you guys for coming. So we'll just get into the first question, and any one of you guys can answer at any time. Um, the first question is, like, what are the disparities that you're seeing um, with the distance learning with virtual learning? Well, I'll start off because in, in middle school, the, the, the RAM is totally a little different because the mindset is totally different because in middle school, you have, I'll say this, in elementary, you have more of a push with parents pushing their kids to actually try to do better, to do more. And me being an elementary school teacher before, I've seen a, a total big, huge gap when parents actually are in tune with their child's education. And now me being in middle school, the kids are basically almost like fending for themselves. So the disparities that I'm seeing now is the students don't really have that push from home. They're basically doing it on their own. So if they're not logging in, it's because they, they don't feel like they want to, they feel like they don't want to do the work. And also they don't have that push from the, from the parental um, aspect. And some of the other disparities that's going on is like you were saying earlier with the homelessness and no access to technology, those things play a part too, because at the school that, um, that I attend, a lot of our kids, and I attend what teach, a lot of our kids are in poverty, homeless, shelters, um, no technology. We ju I just got an email the other day. One of our kids had to move from their home into another into a shelter because of lack of funds. 
from the household now. So it's totally different. So we, so our principal told us to make sure you can, when we're um, giving out work, you have to be a little cautious about how much you give because of some kids may not have the access to what you're getting, what you're giving them to actually be able to fulfill the lesson that you're giving out. So we just have to, we, that is some things that I've discovered. Um, there's a lot of flexibility as far as um, the time that students are, are, are given to complete the assignments. So they must remain disciplined um, to keep their, their work on schedule and turning it in on time. Um, teachers have um, different due dates um, for completion of assignments. For example, some teachers may give assignments and then they are due each day. Um, there are other teachers like myself who um, give assignments about three assignments each week, and then at the end of the week, then that's when the students have to turn it in. So because they have that flexibility, it's going to take part of the students being responsible enough to, to get their work completed. Um, you know, and also it's up to, that, I guess, the teacher's discretion with um, when they give or um, give the due date for the students, them knowing uh, the parents and knowing, you know, who are essential workers who are still working um, in the field and, you know, if your students have the help and the support that they need from home to get those things completed. Um, another thing I also want to um, make note of, because there are different types of learners, I know we have the visual learners, we have the auditory learners, and then there's the kinesthetic Learner. So for the kinesthetic learner, that person who needs or prefers that physical hands-on, um, they don't have. So that's definitely a um, there, you know, so. Yeah, you know, thank you, Beecher, for mentioning that because um, that was something that I was looking at earlier, like I was just doing my study and I'm like, you know, every kid is different, like every person learns mm -hmm. differently. So I'm knowing that this whole virtual thing is probably a struggle for kids who are used to being in a physical class, that are tactile learners that are hands-on. So I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, and I really appreciate that because most, when they put this whole virtual school thing in place, I don't think they even consider that. So I, I thank you for mentioning that. And also, Ruben, I want to go back to something you said. You said that you deal with kids who are, when you say, that are impoverished, I, I'm, I'm guessing they're primarily African-American or Latinos? Yes? Well, majority of my school, um, basically, I came from a school that was 30-30-30, that was like split down evenly, so it was, uh -huh. was beautiful. But now I'm at a school where the population is a lot of IEPs and 504s, and these are our the minority these are the african american the haitian creole students the the, the um, hispanic we have a population of white um, of um caucasian students but it's very small compared and we're in plantation if i can okay. if i may say may add so when you think of that population it, it sounds beautiful oh that's plantation it, that's the that's the area of prestige but this middle school is in is in need of anything that we can get to help our students. And that technology piece, like we just what we're talking about tonight, is one of the one of the biggest things that we struggle with with our students because of they don't have that type of technology at home. So when we give homework, we can't expect for them to actually go to the lab or go go home and do this assignment. We have, like my wife said, you have to give them extended time. We just can't say it's, it's due tomorrow. It may be good for one kid out of 30 that's in your classroom. So you have to remember that you just have to give extra time. My computer's open. My stuff's been open for the last three weeks. I have a due date, but I keep it open. And I send out emails letting the parents know and also the students know I have a due date on there, but I extended grace for you guys to actually be able to still turn in the assignment. Even if it's three weeks late, I'm still giving you the full credit for it. Absolutely, that's awesome. So my, my, my question is also to you is, so how are you, how is your school accommodating the kids, the families who don't have the technology or access to it? 
Well, we um, did the, um, the laptop drive at our school, gave out laptops to each student who, um, with, who needed the laptops. And I believe it, um, but I forgot what cable network is actually helping out, Comcast, Comcast helping Xfinity, out with internet, yeah. Xfinity. Uh -huh. Okay, as well. and so they're helping out as well. So a lot of our kids are actually using that type of um, that technology. And also we told them about using their hotspots because a lot of them do have cell phones. Mm -hmm. So using their hotspot will actually help out as well. Awesome. Okay, thank you. Next question. Um, DeMarcus is going to chime in on this. You could go ahead, DeMarcus. He'll be helping me. Uh, no problem. Great comments thus far. I've I've loved every minute of this. Um. So so, what are you doing to normalize uh, the virtual learning experience for students and parents? Um. Great question. Um. I think the most important thing for me is making sure I keep the line of communication clear between uh, parent to teacher, also teacher to student. Um, providing positive feedback for students as they're going on with the lessons, as well as feedback once they're completing their lessons. Um, the lessons I assigned, like last week was Earth Day, um, so I had the students go to um, on a scavenger hunt to find different things in nature because with uh, me teaching science, they're used to that hands-on approach, and then later on with that hands-on approach, then applying it to those type questions that they'll, they'll have. Um, so for me, normalizing it is still trying to provide them those lessons that I know are reasonable enough for those students who are working alone, possibly, but then also it um, challenges them to, to do their, their very best. Um, so yeah, the lessons I assign are definitely reasonable so that I know that they can be successful with completing them. Um, and then also giving them that hands-on, the hands-on lessons if they have those home uh, materials because sometimes, you know, parents may have the materials. So I still assign those hands-on um, activities for them and I tell them, if you have the materials, go ahead, go for it. Um, for those who don't, then, you know, I kind of normalize it by um, just giving them a reading package or something that, that relates to the standards and the content. Well, on my end, um this was a question that I had to really think about when it comes down to normalizing in a reading classroom. It's very hard because as a reading teacher that's always in the student's face talking about the standards that we have to cover and we, we're trying to be um, the things that I want to say um, to make it to have them prepared for the next grade level, especially with our, te our state being the testing state. So with this, um, the pandemic and everything's going on, you know, they cut out all the testing and everything like that. But to have the kids equipped, they really need that one-on-one -on -one or with that time with that teacher. So to me, this is not really normal to have a student in front of a computer and say, here's a reading passage, here's the standard, I need you to go ahead and, and, and teach yourself and try to get it done. So it's like we have to provide resources. That's the normal part of just giving them resources. And also, I've been giving them grade level rigor reading passages. What I mean by that is I'm not giving them something that's sixth grade, fifth grade, even though they're eighth grade, just to have them to say, I passed the class and I did my job. No, I still want them to provide all the details that I'm asking them from a to, um, point A to point B, recall, restate, summarize, do all the things that um, give me the key details, the main idea, all these things I need from this particular passage so that you can get your, your credit. So it's, it's kind of hard being a reading teacher trying to teach a child how to read but not being present. And you know, that's like one of our hard, um, the hardest, um, one of our lowest key. And, this state of Florida around, you can just say around the world, is comprehension. We can all call, call out words, and, and it sounds beautiful, but the understanding part, understanding what you just read is the big key of passing the test or just getting through life, period. Absolutely. Thank you. So you, um, you, you kind of went into the next question that I was going to go to, into resources.
Um, so Vidra, what are you doing to like additional resources for the parents, the students? Do you have offer like additional resources? Um, well, the district really gives us a lot of resources, so I don't like to um, provide so much to where um, parents and students feel overwhelmed, but um, I do keep them with um, SimScope. Um, I have the um, ReadWorks, which gives them passages, um, then they're comparing and con contrasting two passages and then giving questions in regards to that. Um, that um, Newzella is another um, website that's good, and that focuses more so on informational uh, text. Uh, the Museum of Dis um, Discovery and Science, they have virtual field trips that the students can go on. Um, also Khan Academy for math, and that's more so of like a tutor, like they have the little interactive uh, give them examples and then they have the, it's like the I do, um, we do, you do type thing. Um, also study jams for science as well. So those are some additional resources um, that I use and that I find very helpful for the students. Um, um, other resources that I use in my class, I've been using now, especially with, um, with different things going on. I use News ELA. News ELA, you can actually um, put it on the grade level that, that, that you want the kids to actually um, do the passage on and also the standards. So if I'm working on key ideas, I will find a, um, a passage, an article, it's actually news articles with um, cur it could be current events, what's going on, and I do a lot of current events so they can actually stay on top of what's really going on in the nation um, today versus just giving them just any type of reading. I also use Achieve 3000. That is another um, a reading, uh, yeah, that is another thing that we use for reading that uh, it actually targets the Lexile level and helps them to um, bring the Lexile level up. And the last thing is Study Island. We do, um, I use Study Island. Study Island is basically the same thing, finding a standard, connecting a standard with um, a reading passage, and it actually targets their Lexile and their grade level when it comes down to what read, what read, um, what reading level they're on? Sorry. Okay. Thank you Thank guys you. so much uh, for all this information. It, it is awesome. Um, any general tips or tricks for uh, that you guys have for students and parents during this time of, of virtual learning? I would say my the biggest biggest the biggest thing that I believe with the tip, the one, the one major tip is parents need to be on top of the kids. This, I'm middle school, so a lot of these middle school kids will feed their parents anything they want to hear as far as, I did the work, or um, yeah, I'm doing good. So now when parents, now the parents actually see what the, what the teacher's been going through for the last past <laughs> uh, three to four or five months and now the parents actually need to see like wow I thought you were doing your work in class I see now when you're home you're really doing work here so I think the one major thing is for me for parents is the tip is parents especially with this virtual um, type of learning they must stay on top of their child's grades email and teachers asking them questions what's going on so that like my wife was saying the line of communication that is one of the biggest things for me um for students just make sure you are encouraging them making sure you know you tell them that they're doing a great job um ask the teacher for help um when when help is needed also for the parents make sure that um if you find that the, the uh, student is overwhelmed by maybe the amount of assignments. If you see any red flags, don't hesitate to um, contact the school counselor. The guidance counselors are there. Um, so that gives the students an outlet, someone to talk to and speak with. Um, because, you know, these are um, unmarked territory for us all. Um, know that the teachers are uh, doing our very best to still provide students the information and the standards that they need to be successful, you know, with the next next level as well as beyond so just keep that line of communication clear if the, the parents are um, feeling that it's too much work 
say so, contact the teacher. Um, see if there's something that could be done um, that will alleviate the, the stress of the other students. Thank you. I'm so happy that you shared that, Beecher, because I feel like communication is the key. And for some parents, they think, okay, because the teacher said it has to be done, this is law. And they don't understand that you can actually communicate to the teacher, reach out to the teacher and say, hey, I'm having this problem or this is happening. So I think it's very important to emphasize to the parents to say, hey, this this is what, you know, you can call me anytime. And if you have a question about an assignment, I can sit down and, and you know, I can talk to you. We can talk over the phone. We can do a video chat. But I don't think that parents know or feel they have the authority to do so. They feel like, okay, the school gave us this. Now you have to do it. There's no way around it. And then they sit around and they complain about all this work that's been given instead of reaching out to the teachers and saying, hey, right. I don't think we can meet this. Is there something that could be done about this? So I'm happy that you shared that information because a lot of parents don't know their rights, you know? And Absolutely. Uh, I, I really appreciate you guys so much for coming on and discussing um, just the challenges of being an, an, an educator and also a parent. And I know you guys are a parent too, so you it's not like you're not on the other end too. So you get it both ends. You're the teacher yeah. and you're the parent. So you have to deal with teachers as well yourself. So I really do appreciate you guys for coming on and discussing. And if you have any other recommendations, any tips or any knowledge you want to share with the with other teachers that will might help them in their journey or other parents, please do so and share if you have anything that you want to share at this moment. Well, um, I would say that parents, like you just was talking about, please do contact. Please, um, you are, I would say because I have a lot of IEP and 504 kids. So we have to stay on top. We can't give too much. So we have to be careful. That's why a lot of parents, they need to know the background of their, of their child because if they contact the school and they feel like Johnny is, on an IEP, but the teacher is giving him five or six assignments and he's supposed to get extended time, time and a half on assignments or whatever it is. If they know these things, they can fight it. But like you said, they're not knowledge, if they don't have knowledge on it, they'll be stuck and still trying to, like you talking about it at home versus emailing the teachers. So I will always say just have that, um, the, that line of communication with teachers always. Um, Another thing, the motivation part my wife was talking about, because this doing things on a computer, half the time adults don't like to be on a computer doing work for a very long time. So a child or a middle school, high school, or, or even in elementary, they need a break. So you have to give them some type of motivation, like, okay, at least give you, work on it for 20 minutes. Um, give yourself a break, a, 30, a 20 to 30 minute break, come back. So break it up in increments. So I would tell parents um, and even teachers that's out there listening, if you do have an assignment that's a uh, that 60 minute assignment or a 45 minute assignment, most, let the kid, let the, um, let your um, students know that or let your son and daughter know that you can actually break it. I'm not asking you to do it all at one time, but break it up in increments so that your mind can actually come back because when you're sitting in front of a computer, because in middle school, they don't have just one subject. They have reading, they have um, language arts, they have the math, they have the science, they have the social studies, they have civics. So they have all these assignments coming at them at one time for one whole entire week. So if they get in three assignments from me, they get in three assignments from another teacher, three assignments, two assignments. So we have to have that type of, I, some type of way of mo motivating them. Even if I just say, just give yourself 20 minute break in between so that you can refresh your brain before you before you go crazy because this is a lot to put on a kindergartner because my daughter has a lot of work as well from a kindergartner all the way up to a 12th grader they're getting all this work at one time for one week so it is a lot so motivation i would say motivation is given giving the kids time to actually do the work awesome thank you again and you know what, Ruben, last week I was talking about, um, because I don't work in the school system anymore because I used to work with um, foster care and kids with disability. 
And mm -hmm. I used to be the liaison with the IEPs and the 504s and communicate with the teachers and the counselors and things of that nature. And so my question was, um, my question was, um, how are we accommodating these students last week? That was my question and you, you answered it for me. Um, um, and I, I guess what I was looking for too, because I know we have kids who do have like speech, speech pathologists, how are they being accommodated? Is this something that's virtual ha virtually happening as well too? Or are they coming to the home? It, you know, and those are the things that my mind goes to because I am behavior health and I'm like, oh my gosh, we have so many kids who have learning disabilities, who have different learning styles. And you know, we have the parents, we, we can't forget about the parents because as much as we want to believe the parents should know how to do these things, to be honest, some of the parents don't know this stuff. And they don't know it because they, they don't comprehend it. And some of them are not on the, the level, the proximal level of learning of what their age is. Some of them are 15 years old, mentally they're 15 years old, just like they're 15 year old, you know? So it's like, how do you teach a child um, when they don't have the teacher at home to really teach them? And so I wanted to know, was there like additional resources? And I think you probably answered part of it when you said that they can reach out to the counselors at school. But I wanted to know, I guess, how what additional resources that they have at the school to help accommodate with these accommodations that other students with behavioral, or, you know, mental health disabilities are, or any learning challenges. And you kind of answered it for me, but if you have anything else to go with it, um, awesome. No, the, um, the ESC specialists as well, they have their uh, individual canvases and some of them are reaching out to the students each day. Um, they're having their video conferences with the students um, so that they could, you know, assist them with the, the extra necessities that are needed for them specifically. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I, one of my... Um, the school counselors, they've been emailing, um, emailing me, making sure that some of the students that they actually targeting, especially, um, especially now, they want to make sure that they're getting all the work, that they're being accommodated in if they're turning in the work. So I've been in contact with them as well because they've been making sure that I've been in contact with them because they send out emails and they want to make sure that you are on top of your game with the kids that need those accommodations. And my AP was talking, we just had a, um, what is it? We just had a team meeting and he was talking about that the social worker will be going out to homes um, shortly because a lot of kids haven't been logging in and mm -hmm. a lot of the kids need more accommodation so that the social worker may have to be that, that teacher and also just to go check up and make sure that the kids are actually doing the work or is there other um, other reasons why they're not like we we're talking about the maybe not having a place to stay, maybe not having the right proper technology, or are afraid to even come out to say they're struggling or they they going through, so that they're just rather not to have the kids to do the work. And another thing that a lot of kids are holding on to is they believe that if they don't do the work anyway, they're being passed on. So even though we know that that is the big thing or oh, you're going to be promoted anyway but they don't understand that they still have to show some evidence of work if they do not show evidence of work they will be back in the same grade that is not our goal our goal is to get you prepared and be promoted for the um come to the next grade but they don't have nothing no evidence no work haven't been um logging in or anything like that they made it clear that's when the social worker was um step in to let the parents know, hey, if Johnny is not logging in and not doing any work and he's missing his points, he needs four points to, um, to be promoted from his class and all he has is three and he hasn't been logging in, it may be a good chance that Johnny's still been eighth grade. So that's when they're going to start putting the heat in at the entrance now that's given to come out shortly after May 1st. That's when the social worker will be going out to homes. Awesome. And that's Thank you. I really appreciate that for sharing that knowledge. Um, so we do have a question. Tammy, where are you? you can I'm here. Be ready. Go I'm ahead. here. Okay. So I didn't have a question, but I just wanted to add in. I know what works for me um, and my class um, on Zoom. 
what I've been doing is because in the beginning I had a hard time getting them on. But what I did last was called a virtual um, spirit week where on Monday we did crazy hat, Tuesday, um, crazy sock, Wednesday, lunch with me, Thursday, um, shades, Friday, favorite sport team shirt to get them motivated because it's something that's hard for them to actually get on, log on. But when you make it fun for them and engaging, you'll be surprised how many students get on. And they are actually on the weekend messaging you, telling you, what are we doing Monday? What are we doing Tuesday? So um, that's one thing that I wanted to add, just making it engaging for the students. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. Good. Awesome. So, yeah. So um, anybody else have any questions? I really thank you for sharing that, Tammy, because, you know, maybe we can help each other out with teaching and parenting and stuff like that. This, this should be a community where we should come together and help each other out. What, where do you teach at again, Tammy? And what grade? I'm at Myrtle Grove. I have third grade. Okay, elementary. Okay, awesome. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Okay, do, do we have any other questions, any comments, or any concerns? You, If you want to, you can use the chat box and you can uh, type a question. I also put in some resources that, um, that Ruben and Vidra said. I didn't get all of them, but I tried to type as fast as I could. So if you guys have any other resources that y'all want to put in a chat comment, and we could share that later with parents or teachers or students. Uh, that would be awesome. So before I end, uh, I just kind of wanted to share something with you guys. I want to share my screen really quickly. And I'll just hold on for a second. Let me check my screen. So this was given to me by someone recently, I guess this was passed around a couple of years ago. And it talks about, cause I don't, cause I ain't got a pencil. And it reads, I woke up, I woke myself up because we ain't got no, we ain't got an alarm clock dug in a dirty clothes basket. Cause ain't nobody washed my uniform, brushed my hair and teeth in the dark. Cause the lights ain't on. Even got my baby sister ready. Cause my mama wasn't home. Got us both to school on time to eat us a good breakfast. Then when I got to class, the teacher fussed because I ain't got a pencil. So it, this, this hits home and it, it, and it really talks about, it highlights what we've been talking about last week and this week because a lot of times, and I, I don't have anything against teachers or parents or students, a lot of times teachers forget that as, as much as we want to believe that students should be prepared, a lot of kids don't have these things. And we deal with the population, especially if you work in, and the Murder Grove is right there in Miami Garden. So I know that's a predominantly African-American school. And also Ruben mentioned, you know, him being in plantation in predominantly African-American low income area. And these are things that we so, we, yes. we often forget because, uh, you know, we so focus on getting the work done, the work needed to done, to be done. When in actuality, these kids have so much on their plate, so much that we can even understand, we can't even comprehend. Some of them have taken care of younger siblings. Some of them, you know, don't have lights at home. So I just also want us to really consider that when we think about what these kids are going through, because it's a big shift and a big change for all of us. So, um, yeah, I just kind of wanted to bring that up because I think it's important for us to not forget about the children. And yes, the work has to be done. And I, I do come in all of the, the teachers and the parents who are getting the work done and who's allowing them, allowing students the extra grace to get the work done. So with that being said, any questions, comments, concerns? Nope. 
So next week, uh, we're going to have a parent that's coming on who was actually an ex-teacher who her child attends school in Broward County. And she actually took, I won't say she took the, her child off a of virtual school, but the curriculum that the teacher was having that had provided for the child wasn't up to par. So she created her own curriculum. So she's going to be on next week. And hopefully we can have some parents to kind of chime in or we can share that information with them so that she could explain how she was able to change her child curriculum to what she felt like was a, I guess, a learnable, a learning, a learnable curriculum. So that's it. Anybody else have anything? No. Nope. Well, thank, I really go thank ahead. Thank you, Brady. Roxanne. I want to appreciate you. Uh, thank you all of those who joined us today, Ruben and Vidra Johnson, brother Demarcus Grayson, sister Tammy Hawkins, uh, and just this is a great conversation and, and just solidified around the fact that there are so many things to consider in distance learning and some of the challenges that we face. I feel empowered. I think we've got some resources uh, that we can share with our community now with these websites. Reworks.com, Achieve 3000, uh, Newsala, Khan Academy, StudyJams.com, STEM Scopes, and so many other things. So we, we've got some things that we've done. Tammy, I think your comment about Spirit Days have been, you know, really blessed us. I know me as an educator, a new educator, even with Surge Academy, our Christian school at the Hope Church of Christ. Um, I've been trying to find ways to motivate them. They've always been learning on their computers. That's, that's our model. Uh, but even they have found it challenging uh, now that they're learning at home, because home is usually seen as sort of a place uh, of, of refuge, a place that you're not as engaged and as focused. And so that's one of the issues that even us as a virtual school have been running into. So we're all praying for ways and discussing ways how we can improve and get better. And just appreciate you all so much and what you brought to the table. As Roxanne said, we'll do it again next week. This has been the Community Care Conference brought to you by the Old Church of Christ. In the midst of a pandemic, we need real, relatable, and reliable information to help us deal with some of the issues specifically as they relate to our community. I'm Brother Brandon O'Doy, Assistant Minister of the Hope Church of Christ. We join you every week, Sundays at 7 p.m. Look for us again on next week. And until then, may God bless you and keep you real good is our prayer. Be blessed.